It's Kubrick's Universe, the Stanley Kubrick Podcast. Hey there. If you didn't already know, we are still celebrating 50 years of Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. Gillian Hills is an actress, singer, songwriter, poet, artist, and illustrator. She really is the definition of the term Renaissance woman. Born in Egypt, Gillian spent her early years in France, where she was discovered at the tender age of 14 by Roger Vadim, the director of And God Created Woman, and Barbarella. Vadim described her as the next Brigitte Bardot and cast her in his version of Dangerous Liaisons, released in 1959. In 1960, at 15, Gillian was cast in the lead of the British film Beat Girl, with co-stars Adam Faith, Christopher Lee, and Oliver Reed. That same year, Gillian recorded her first records with Henri Salvador for the French record label Barclay, and in 1961, she appeared at the Olympia Theater in Paris on the bill with Johnny Halliday. Serge Gainsbourg wrote his first duet for Hills, which they sang together on French TV in 1963. She was soon signed to the AZ record label and continued to record her self-penned songs, as well as cover versions of the latest pop songs. Then another string of films followed. She appeared in Michelangelo Antonioni's first English language film, the classic 1966 Blow Up. Other highlights include the film version of John Osborne's Inadmissible Evidence from 1968, The Owl Service from 1969, and a television adaptation of the Alan Garner novel, Georges Franju's Le Faux de l'Abbé Mouret. Gosh, I hope I didn't just butcher that title. I'm sure I did. Anyway, she also replaced Marianne Faithful in the 1972 horror Demons of the Mind for Hammer Film Productions. Gillian then moved to New York and enjoyed a successful career as a book and magazine illustrator. In recent years, her music has been featured in the film Mezzarine Part 1, Killer Instinct with Vincent Cassell, the season 5 premiere of Mad Men in 2012, and most recently, The Queen's Gambit in 2020. And she has just released her new self-penned album, Lily, which she says reflects on her early years, aged between 11 and 19. But this is Kubrick's universe after all, and so we must tell you that Gillian also appeared in, you guessed it, drumroll please, A Clockwork Orange. She was one of the two young ladies that Alex picked up in the record store. So come with uncle, and hear old proper, hear angel trumpets and devil trombones. You are invited. So, Jillian, thank you very much for coming on Kubrick's Universe. We really appreciate you having us. Thank you. Of course. <laughs> if, I, if I may, can I just begin with uh, the obvious question, which would be, how did you get your role in A Clockwork Orange, and what was the audition like? Well, you generally get a call from your agent, and they said, go and see Kubrick, so... Uh, I go, and it's a tiny little waiting room with lots of girls uh, waiting, like me. And um, every time a new girl came out of the door that went into uh, what we thought was, I don't know, an interview or something like that, um, she came out looking fairly shocked. And I was wondering what it was, and we all did, actually, in the end. And anyway, so I go in, and I meet a delightful gentleman. And he says to me, I'm awfully sorry, but I'm going to have to ask you uh, to take off your top clothes. Of course, you you, you, you keep your underwear on them. And um, I'm going to hand you uh, something from bus stop that Marion Monroe uh, was speaking 
So I thought, well, this is quite surreal. There's nothing wrong. I, I could be in the beach. So I don't have a problem taking my, you know, my my little clothes off, you know. We in those days I think I might have had short skirts. I, I can't remember. But anyway, um, and he get, gives me the the paper. And I remembered vividly thinking this was bus stop. This was Marilyn Monroe. She had passed away. And I remember being in Paris. Uh, I was, eight, I think I was 18 when this happened and being an utter, utter shock. And at that time, my French agent had shot himself in the head. So I had these two things um, to contend with and thinking what a strange world we lived in and how dangerous it was to have a gun close to you. Supposing you get uh, guffuffled or terribly upset or, or whatever. I mean, obviously my agent killed himself for a particular reason. He must have had the revolver in his in his desk. And Marilyn, God only knows what happened with her. So. It was an honor. I felt it was a total honor to read Bus Stop. And I was delighted. I thought, I just hope I can, I can be good enough. And it wasn't for Kubrick or that wonderful, very polite person who was interviewing me and, um, and who was uh, to do his job. Stanley Kubrick wasn't there. Um, Stanley was a person who was into other details uh, and film tests were a part of the details. So I passed the test and I walked off and I smiled at all the girls in the room because I wanted to make them feel okay when they went in, not come out with a face as if, uh, I don't know, I'd seen a murder or something. So that, that was my introduction to doing the film test of Stanley Kubrick. If I'm not mistaken, I believe shortly thereafter, there was a film test with Kubrick himself. What are your recollections of that? Um, do you know, I have none. <laughs> I, because I don't think, you see, Stanley uh, really dealt with the most important blocks in, his, in, in what he was doing. And if he saw a film test, uh, he had a pretty good idea because also you have to turn sideways, you know, both ways, face, uh, profile, one side, profile the other. So he knew what I looked like. So I, I, I frankly don't remember. Maybe for other parts this happened, but it certainly didn't happen with me as far as I remember. Keeping with the Clockwork Orange uh, introduction that you'd had, you know, one of the things that can get lost uh, aside from the trivia is the fact that, you know, the legendary British hairstylist Vidal Sassoon had in fact dyed your hair orange for your part. Do you have any recollections of that? Um, because your hair doesn't look quite so orange in the film itself. If you no, I, well, what I did was a very naughty thing, of course. Because oh, do tell. <laughs> no, I'm in the sense that whenever I went out, before I began filming, uh, I had to wait a few days. And whenever I went out, I had the most ghastly looks, and they were quite violent, specifically from women. And I realized that somebody was going to try and smack me because they would come close and they would look directly into my eyes. And I thought, well, I'm not having this. I'm going to start washing my hair and, you know, cross my fingers that nobody notices. And that's what I did. I washed and I washed and I washed. And I, when I got there, nobody noticed. <laughs> Very <laughs> naughty. I know. But, you know, I believe personally that some of, you know, Sometimes you give directions to an assistant and it goes to whoever. I, I, think, um, I think two things. Either Stanley was totally caught up in his, in his uh, work when I, when, I, when I came on board. Uh, I remember the first scene. You know, it was unforgettable because we were, we were filming 
as the, the story unfolded, which is the most expensive way to do. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Which and and the only other person uh, I knew was Antonioni in Blow Up. So and it's it's much better actually for the actors. Um, so when I came on board and I was there, um, what happened is he singled. He knew who was who, and he pointed at me and he said, "I like her mouth, and I want her in profile." So I was put in profile, and he said, "I want you to uh, suck on a lollipop." And then, of course, I realized the implications of what it meant. You see, mm-hmm. so um, I thought it had been cut out, um, but actually, it wasn't. It was left. So there, they had, I have a very plump mouth on a very plump um, lollipop, which had a particular. Um, what would you call that shape? Mm-hmm. You know, so um, that was my introduction. I was very fascinated by Stanley because the, there was enormous crew, and we were play, we were working at the drugstore, which was on King's Road. It was very beautiful, um, and I I was really glued to how he was directing and how he was talking to the technicians. He was totally in control. And it was beautiful to watch. It was like a ballet. Mm. It sounds like your mind was taking notes quite a yes. bit. Yes, I'm very visual. Mm. Mm. What other memories do you have that uh, first day shooting in Chelsea Drugstore? One thing happened. Uh, it was a bit naughty of me, but it was that what I call the gobbledygook. That means a language which uh, which did not exist, but mm-hmm. existed in the book. Uh, so I was very friendly with, immediately with the young girl who was going to play with me. She was really an absolute sweetheart. And I whispered to her, take my words. Right. And I'll be looking at the albums and et cetera, et cetera. She did it. And Stanley didn't notice because it worked perfectly well. The thing is, by taking my, my words and I was ignoring Malcolm, it made sense than mm. me also talking to him. There mm-hmm. was one girl who was interested and sweet and funny and laughing. Pardon me, ladies. There was me who was a little bit standoffish and a little bit sort of full of herself, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, total opposites, and it works. Enjoying that, are you, my darling? Bit cold and pointless, isn't it, my lovely? What's happened to yours, my little sister? Who are you getting, Braddy? Goggly go go. Johnny Zhivago, the Heaven 17, hmm? What you got back home, little sister, to play your fuzzy warbles on? I bet you got little, say, pitiful, portable picnic players. Come with uncle and hear all proper. Hear angel trumpets and devil trombones. You are invited. That's fascinating because it's yet another story in the canon of how often Stanley was going by a script and yet malleable to the input of so many working to bring the script to life. We've heard stories like this before, but it's wonderful to hear that you got to make your own contribution in this regard. It's really cool. I didn't think of it. I thought of it as hiding, you know, Mm -hmm. but uh, because I was very shy. I, uh, you know, actors are not supposed to be shy. But often you, if you see me, you will see me not really half my face, you know, as mm-hmm. years go by. I, I was always like that. Um, and then I warmed up. I was okay. Mm. Mm. So much of uh, the viewer's introduction to all the characters in Clockwork Orange comes from, you know, striking costume design. So we have mm. to ask if you worked with uh, Melina Cananera um, and if you have any recollections of how either she or you two 
came to ideas that completed your outfit? No, because you see, if you notice my outfit, it's um, it's a knitted sort of cream colored dress. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. And also, if you look at the other girl, you don't really notice her clothes. That is just the you, you don't. Mm. What you notice is her face. Uh, she had a little bit of um, a violet color, purple color, in her dark hair. She had little, little, little strings of it painted on her hair. Um, and I have just got this very plain dress. I think that if um, the people who had to stand out were the the others, what I call the others, that group of boys that were violent. Mm. Nobody else seems to, in my mind, stand out. Even when you go to, for example, the artist's studio. I mean, it wasn't her studio so, as much as her home. She's dressed as we would dress today, actually. You know, these long, these, these sort of trousers, which... Uh, are like skin on our legs. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very, very modern in that way. Um, but I think that he put his energy in the crowd, in Malcolm, and I call the crowd is the boys, mm -hmm. and the backdrops. The backdrops were wonderful. It, I think his wife uh, was could have been involved in colors because she was an artist in her own right. And he was very, very lucky to have a wonderful relationship like that. Indeed. So I think that she was, she was very helpful. Um, and the clothes, I would think that she might have uh, thought we should have it maybe this way and that way, you know, and she talked to her husband about that. It's wonderful to have a partnership like that. It's, ta it's, it's, uh, it's quite rare. Because a lot of film directors keep their wives away. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, there's, those are really fascinating, you know, observations that you're bringing up. And of course, many of us uh, fans of Kubrick, who've been fans for many decades now, uh, are, you know, to the extent that it's... Uh, reasonable we are you know envious of of people like stanley and christiana for having found each other if you will because i think it's clear they they complemented each other very very well yes um yes. and they they had something that uh precious few folks on this earth are able to uh to have and for so long yes Yes. You know, the thing about Stanley is he was a genius. There are very few geniuses. And if you look at the film again, just see what he does with the music. It's, it's um, bar none. Nobody's that. Nobody, nobody has that sound. Nobody, it's, it's, it's so, it's spectacular. Oh, absolutely. You know, Right, and visually arresting in every regard. Yeah, it's a it's a work of art. It's it's a picture of what we have become. Actually, you know, if you think of certain countries, uh, I won't name them. You know, they can be very violent. Um, it doesn't take much. It's like it takes a little match, and. The flame goes up and something happens. That's what wars are all about. That's what the world is about. Yes. Unfortunately, you know, true. Unfortunately, yes. Mm. As others have said, you know, the uh, barricade which separates civilized society from utter chaos is a very thin barricade indeed. It's, it's porous. Mm, that's the perfect word. Thank you. Mm. He's very political. Stanley is very p political. And there, there are parts of the world, even now, that do not have free will. Mm -hmm. We, we, uh, we have free will to a degree. We have free will. 
we often read things which are not correct. Mm -hmm. I remember when I came to England, I was 14, and I read the papers. I remember reading a very highly respected um, journalist. His name was William Hickey. And he said something which was perfectly what I had said. But the rest must have been sort of somebody in the office thought, thought of perking it up, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, for a 14-year-old who was convent trained in, in, at, at sort of early age and went through several convents, um, I believed that people told the truth. And I still... I'm a person like that. I either don't say anything or I tell the truth. I'm not frightened of God. It's nothing to do with that. It's become a, a sort of part of my personality. Um, so we still have places where the truth is not told, many mm. countries, but it is not, uh, let's say, in view of of that's of us. We don't see it. In Stanley Kubrick's film, it is in your face and they wear special clothes, but so do the others. We, we, are, we are in a world that we don't quite understand, you know. The world, we are a tiny little planet and yet there are so many countries, so many languages, so many ways of expressing and things you're supposed to do and not not do mm -hmm. it's it's um it's it's fascinating and sometimes saddening and horrifying mm -hmm. and things can turn on the slip of your toe In, indeed and it's everything you've described seems to be part of the social construct and the social contracts that we have devised through the course of civilization and yet once in the who knows how long a Stanley Kubrick will come along and kind of just tear off the veneer as yes. you say and just allow us to see the truth yes. for what it is um, and that is a very rare and precious thing indeed yes um, it's wonderful to hear you make the comments you just have regarding that Stanley was a very quiet man when he was working. Very quiet, very knowledgeable, and, and kind. I never heard him lift his voice. Never. He would just adjust the scene. If it didn't work one way, he moved it in a slightly different way. And this made for total silence, and total concentration. You knew, you knew that he was special. And as animals are the same as us, they know who is the master. They know who is the one they should follow. Mm. 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 That's quite profound. Very profound indeed. I mean, that because what you said just ties right back into the capital T immutable intransigent truth of our experience as humans, if you will, and, and knowing it when you see it, because it is so rare. And yet it seems to be hardwired in our perceptions that if, and when it presents itself, we automatically know. Yes. Fascinating. I, I meant to ask you, uh, a few moments back about uh, when you had mentioned Malcolm, if you had any reaction to uh, hearing Malcolm's dialect of the NADSAT. <laughs> and if so, um, what was your yeah. reaction? Uh, I just think, look, Malcolm wasn't it is, I mean, Malcolm is special. Malcolm is unique. Malcolm put his whole body, soul, love, he gave it to Stanley. And at the same time, he gave it to us. The language that is used in the book, in the film, is poetic. You will, you will catch it. 
you understand what is being said, and yet it sounds garbled. Mm. You know, Anthony Burgess was quite not, I'm saying unusual. He was spectacular. Mm. I mean, I don't know. The language in the film is you understand every single word and yet is garbled. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? Well, you've also got uh, the actor. Now, this actor has the most expressive face I've ever seen. There's eyes, enormous eyes. He doesn't say, he does, he not, every move he makes is right. And he could make me laugh. I remember um, we were waiting for our scene, a scene that was supposed to be done with a snake. And the snake was in a box under the bed. And Malcolm was very frightened. Um, he, he was terrified of snakes. And we lay, all three of us, the two girls and Malcolm in the middle. But Malcolm chose to, spoke to, to speak to me. I don't know. Maybe because um, he had to, the next scene was going to be uh, with the snake. And after that, I think it was on the bed. I think, I think it was on the bed. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a habit of actors to soften um, the other actresses, you know, in case there's, there's, they, they get scared of something or it's a difficult scene. Yes. Um, but, but he was so funny that he had me in stitches, <laughs> in stitches. So when, when, I ha when we had to do the bed scene, um, I couldn't stop laughing hysterically because it wasn't i originally when you lie in the bed you think oh sh blast right mm -hmm. now we're going to go through hell it's going to be worse than the dentist 10 times more mm -hmm. um and uh some people faint at dentists <laughs> um i just i i thought well i'm with a person who is sweet who is funny, who is in the same pot as I am, and we're going to be fine. And we were, because, you see, this young actor had genius in him also. I think it's something that Stanley recognized. He was very agile. He was, he had, he was very generous, and he was quick on the, on the mark. Mm. Um, and I looked at the film last night. I hadn't seen it in absolutely years because I forget what I do. I just live directly in the present or in the future. That's wonderful. Um, you know, um, except if I have to think about the past for my podcast. No, so that's, that, a, I, that's I, a great I way to live, if I may say. Yeah. <laughs> we should Otherwise, all, you know, but go on, please. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, I think looking at it slow motion, it's hilarious. It's absolutely, there's nothing sexual in it. It's a romp, but it's a hilarious romp without clothes. Um, it's I've very never cartoonish. Seen like yes, it is. But you see, it's due to, to, to Malcolm because um, he just was so giving. He was so generous. He was so relaxed. He wasn't like one of those actors who want to have his face, you know, shown he wants his best profile or what well, he was he was vivid he was alive vivacious he was and he was giving and he mm. was also giving to stanley he knew what stanley wanted so mm. for me he was one of the most wonderful actors ever to work with mm. At praise indeed we were fortunate to speak with him uh not that long ago and um for our small part, everything you've just described really did come through quite clearly. Um, his generosity of spirit. Yes. Um, and, you know, even at a moment, I recall uh, having him, having asked him to answer a question, which we're sure he's been asked a thousand times over and um, feeling the need to slip in a caveat that, well, you know, us old guys have been, you know, fascinated with Stanley for however long now, but, you know, we like to help uh, younger folks if we have any small part in that by virtue of doing our show. Uh, 
to learn some things that maybe they don't know or that we take for granted as having read about years past. Mm. So mm. he was so gracious when, and he just, I rem- never forget, he went, oh, right, okay. And this, you know, answered the question as though it re- he were asked the first time, um, but not in any rote or um, kind of derivative fashion that was something seemed to have come from a, a, a textbook or, you know, mm. a playbook rather uh, of mm. his own. It was fresh, it was innovative, and it was sincere. Yes. That's the beauty of Malcolm. See, that you've, you've used the right word, sincerity. And that's who Malcolm is. Malcolm is a special person. And I hold him very dear in my heart. He's one of those actors, the few actors I've met, who he's not egocentric. Uh, he's not looking at himself, wondering, is it my good profile, my bad one, or this or that, or, you know, will I be seen in such, how do I, you know, how do I uh, get my face to be seen more than it should be? You know, no, there are no tricks with Malcolm. Mm. He, that's why he's so beautiful. Mm. As, as actors go, that's the best one can hope to either be or work with one who's just yes. as fascinated with what you might call the ugly underneath as, uh, you know, as much as they are hitting their mark, getting things right, technically being true to the character, being true to the scene, being generous to the other actors. Yes. And yeah. that does take a special person. So it's no wonder that uh, we got the film that we did, Mm. A true masterpiece as a result of I think it is. Me, of, I think it of the is. two of them working so closely together and everyone else, of course, I think Kubrick yes. would be the first to say that, you know, the, the contributions made by everyone allowed him to, uh, if you will, you know, kind of go off and, and be the genius. Of course, he would never describe himself as such, but mm. the accomplishment of fulfilling the the completion the fruition from the germ of the idea to right that's the final edit print and you know the film is ready to be shown it's almost like uh i i liken it sometimes uh to the way musicians and songwriters can come to feel about songs we create songs they create if you have yeah. a if you if you have a moment alone it's like a child you you've worked so hard at it mm. and you want it to be the best it can because you have a moment alone yeah and then it must go out into the world and like a child be judged on its own merits based on the best advantages you've given it mm. Mm. well stanley was a genius and malcolm Malcolm is unique. There's nobody like Malcolm. You know, he's he he looks like nobody. Hmm. He's he has a warmth, um, a generosity, which is uh, so unusual. And I'm not saying the other actors. I mean, I've I've, I've worked with generous actors, but he he's special. He's totally special, and I know that, that Stanley must have realized that. Mm. Um, and I think that, that from what I understand, they both huddled together and, and talked. I, I remember seeing them in the mornings. I didn't know what they were talking about, and I thought I'd better ignore that because, you know, it's, it's private. But he had the total, um, not only admiration, but his crew working with him, they idolized him. Mm. So anything he wanted, I mean, I remember when his camera went wrong and it would have taken two months to have it repaired because it was a special camera and he needed that special camera uh, for, for the shots. Um, and everybody was silent. He undid, he undid the, that, that, that very heavy camera, you know, and put it back together absolutely slowly because, you know, if, if you missed a tiny little thing it would not work it was that complicated Mm. so stanley was stanley was um he and he didn't have a big head 
That means he didn't have, he knew he was Stanley Kubrick. He knew he had a gift, but his energy didn't go into that. His energy went into his imagination, how it had to be, keeping all his files right, finding the right place, finding the right people to work with. That was Stanley. Thank you again. Um, pure gold. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> really, Jillian. It's, it's wonderful. I, I, I would be loath to forget asking about a couple of the, the technical details that might have gone into uh, the filming of the bedroom scene. Of course, you know, the bedroom scene was, was shot at a mere two frames per second. And then when it was played back, uh, it appeared very fast. And in reality, it only took about 20 minutes to film that entire sequence in real time, lasted just less than a minute in the film. Do you have any recollection of how many takes uh, you did? One. <laughs> <laughs> you can't redo these things. You can't. It's wow. life. You're not, you're, you're not acting. Mm -hmm. That scene is not acting. We're mm -hmm. putting our clothes on. They get torn off. You know, mm -hmm. we have No, this was just one scene, and it lasted as long as, as, <laughs> as it's supposed to. It wasn't a, you know, it was just then he decided to do it, like, very fast, like Charlie Chaplin. Mm -hmm. It's a humor. Very much so. Very much Chaplin-esque. Hmm. Brilliant. Was Stanley directing uh, any or everything that went on in the bedroom? Was he? No, not at all. Not yeah, at all. Let it rip. Let it no, rip. No, it was. Yeah, it was Malcolm. Malcolm jumping around like a grasshopper. He was. He was. He was exquisite. He was <laughs> funny. You know, we we would. You know, we'd put uh, our clothes. But I, the only thing I ever remember was, you know, like put your clothes on. So we you know we'd hop out of bed, put our clothes on, take your clothes off, off, off can our, our clothes, you know, mm. and and that's what it was. It was it, it actually, I think it was the funniest. It was the funniest scene I'd ever made, and I'm such a prude, I couldn't be a prude because <laughs> it it was um it it was done in a funny way, right? You know, and so. You weren't really naked in the end because you were covered up with all the fun, with of all course, the laughter. Of course. Yeah. It, it, Stephen noticed that when you slow the scene down to a normal speed, you can see little details like Malcolm putting the bowler hat on you and at one point spraying everyone's armpits with deodorant. <laughs> well, that's, I don't know who, who thought of that, but. Um... There must have been a bowler hat there. I mean, a bowler um, um, there on purpose. And he must have said, oh, I want some spray, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was up to Malcolm to um, to choreograph it. And I think he Malcolm had exquisite um, instinct. Mm. I think Malcolm was very, very important to the film. Um, he brought a lot. And this film that could have been, let's say this scene that could have been used as something, uh, shall we say, um, you know, like obscene. It wasn't at all. Mm. It was the reverse. Yes, it was yes. absolutely reverse. I don't know. I think that Malcolm um, talked to me a lot more than to my companion. Um, I think she was a bit dreamy. And I had... A quick laughter. He must have noticed that. And so we both were huddled on the bed. Well, all three of us. But Malcolm spoke to me mostly. And I always got into a fit of giggles. So I think he took that. He remembered that. And this is the way the scene went. It was a, it's a, it's a truly funny, funny thing. And that's why it's sort of like 1930s, mm -hmm. the new, 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 new films where people, where the filmmaking was a different thing. It was new and not quite there. Well, interesting as well. This has just occurred to me, given that you had described yourself a, a, a little while back as, you know, choosing to be standoffish with your character in um, uh, uh, the, the Chelsea uh, drugstore scene and also describing yourself naturally 
just now as somewhat prudish. And yet what we get on the screen is, as you say, like you're the one who's giggling. Yeah. Uh, that is something that had to have come out on the day, as it were, that were, it was just a, oh, a, a result or a byproduct of uh, a natural chemistry that was yes. taking place, allowed to take place uh, between the three actors and, of course, Kubrick. Yes. Kind of just yeah. saying, okay, go with it. Um, yes. And it, it, there was a third scene, if I'm not mistaken, which involved you and um, the other gal, Glynis O'Brien, which was to have taken place directly after the bedroom session. Apparently it, yeah. it involved the two of you, the two gals walking into uh, the lounge of Alex's parents flat and, uh, and speaking to Alex's dad, of course, Philip stone uh, while you were still in your underwear. Do you have any yeah. memories of shooting that? Please tell us. Uh, well, the memory <laughs> I had was not some, the memory that, that that's let's say has remained mm. was Malcolm's face of total terror. <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was frightened of snakes, and this one, you see, it had been kept in a cooler under the bed, so all the time. But this time, it was out. I think it was out, and Malcolm had a. You know, as I said, he was terrified of snakes. And his look, he has these enormous eyes. Yes, his look yes. was of enormous but terrified. And instead of being, I think it was, in the end, it was a, a scene that could have been easily cut out because it didn't really mean anything. What do you do? You've got two girls in, in, in an apartment and you've got some people there. What did it bring to the film? That's the way Stanley must have thought. It, it, it brought, uh, it just brought one face that was slightly white, <laughs> whiter than usual, <laughs> a pair of blue eyes that were more open than usual, mm -hmm. you know, and <laughs> Very two quiet, very quiet girls who did not work that we didn't move, you know, uh, in case hello, the you know, the snake might be interested in us because it was one of those. If they got around your neck, it crushed it. It was a very dangerous one. He had a keeper, so of course, the keeper would have known how to deal with it, mm. but we didn't trust anything, we just trusted nature. So, right. so which is the smart play around yeah. the snake <laughs> it has its own nature it doesn't know a thing about acting oh no it is no. a snake yeah it's 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 really interesting that your memory of uh of alex um of of, of malcolm you know and his his big eyes it kind of it, you know during the the scene that was uh, was discarded, as you say, you know, Kubrick would have left anything out that did not, shall we say, propel the story forward. Uh, yes. And, now, this um, would have propelled it backwards. You come from a funny scene and you go on to something else. Right, right. We, we've also heard that there was possibly yet another scene that was shot in the so-called pasta parlor um, where the three of you... Uh, had gone to eat before uh, getting back to Alex's flat. Now that is in Burgess's book, but do you recall if that was ever filmed or not? No, I think that Stanley filmed what was needed to be filmed. Right. Right. And right. nothing, I mean, a pasta parlor would have meant nothing really, you know, mm -hmm. it, I don't think it brought, it might've brought the writer uh, a link to another scene but for Stanley it didn't it, it just it was as limp as a pasta as I would say. <laughs> a, a perfect analogy um, now you know having worked for over 10 years in film and television mostly in mainland Europe 
with directors such as uh, Roger Vadim and, of course, Michelangelo and Tonioni. We have to ask, what was it like, in contrast, to work with Kubrick in the United Kingdom? Um, well, you know, when you're doing a film test and you're 14, uh, there is curiosity and terror. So it has nothing to do with when you're being... You you don't know, doesn't matter if somebody, if you're told by the makeup person that you've got the part not to be frightened and just go out there and be yourself. You know, these things, um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a world which is so utterly different from the normal world of summertime on the beach. You know, mm. um, this, I, I actually was very fortunate with Vadim because... Vadim was wonderful with me. He was the first person who treated me like a person, not like a child. Do this, do that, and no, not that. No, he he sat down and he asked me questions about who I was, what I liked, what it was always. He made suddenly he introduced me to the fact the, the the fact that a 14 year old could be treated as well as a grown up because i came from a background where children did not speak and they did what they were told and it was a bit strange because at 14 it's true that i was tall for my age i did not look 14 i could easily pass for 17 because I was tall and because I was already formed, I, I just formed quite early at the age of 12, I looked 15. Um, so that team brought me a lot. And then later on, um, there was a film with, um, it was very fashionable to make films in three pieces, in three parts. And um, that team, was on set at one point. There was hardly anybody. It was me, Vadim, and maybe two or three other people. And he came up to me and he said, Gillian, that's how he called me, I wrote this part for you. Um, and that I was incredibly touched by. I thanked him. And it was in those days, as I said, films were made often in three parts uh, or four parts, totally different stories, totally different, and totally different actors. Um, I, I thanked him, of course, but I w what I missed was not so much not having worked with him, which would have been a, a wonderful education, I know, but the fact that he was so interested and did not treat a girl of 14 like she was brain dead, you know, um, he treated me kindly and with tenderness, and I shall always remind, remember him. So you see, I, I stutter on that word because I really did like him enormously. He was a gentleman. That's wonderful, and it's always very touching to hear of anyone who got that treatment in their younger age when so many children, you know, even before what could be called young adulthood, children are, are spoken to and, and treated as people. Well, he, he actually taught me. He taught me that I was, I was a human being with my own thoughts and the questions that he asked me um, were questions that were very relevant and I had never before even imagined anybody asking me. And um, they were, some of them, private. But I realized through him that I was separate. I mean, separate from family, separate from do this, do that. And you don't do that. And you sit there and not there. The, you know, these are very important things. I think they give you confidence and they, they actually smooth the path for the person. So I, 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 in a way, I, 
I didn't want to go into films at all. I wanted my education. That was the most important thing. But in a way, I got this gift given to me by Vadim. And also the fact that he wrote a part for me meant that he he was helping me. And his friend, Christian Marcon, who's a very, very close friend of his, I know that I got messages from, you know, through somebody, uh, from Christian, uh, dye your hair dark because uh, for, for a film. Just, just dye your, 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 your hair dark right now. And so I, that's what I did. I found myself, you know, opposite um, Catherine Deneuve. So, and I, he was always um, following me, Christian. And Christian was the best friend of, of Vadim. So I had, I had a little angel somewhere. Hmm. <laughs> Do you feel that there was a trajectory that might have, or a continuum, if you will, what I'm getting at is, and if not, please answer honestly either way, was Kubrick able to uh, sort of foster that sense of, independent growth that that spirit of the mind if you will that began with your work with Vadim and Christian when you came to work on Clockwork Orange well no because you see the thing about Stanley is that he was he was like a person who was totally involved with his box that was the camera, that was his treasure, that was his life. And the actors, the ones he chose, he knew that they were going to do what he wanted them to do. He didn't even question that. So he was at home. I felt that the people who were working behind him, the lighting, uh, the cameraman, the all of those assistants, he didn't have a big crew. He had a small crew, and they all knew him from the past. That was his family. That is what he had given to him and was his life. And the actors were the ones who were giving him what he wanted, but the crew were helping him do the small things that he didn't want to do, he could not do, he didn't have the time to do. They were there picking up the pieces. They were there to make sure that it was just like going through silk. That's what they were there for. The thing is, um, acting is instinct. And you split yourself away from yourself. So in the end, you become the, the character. Therefore, your gestures should automatically be correct, be right. So I gave the girl something. I gave her what I was saying. But I was doing something that she was doing also, which was going through the records. But I decided that if I went through the records in a way which was very intense. I was looking, I was really involved. I, you know, this young boy who came between us, I didn't care at all about. I might look at him, you know, once, but I was interested in the music, whereas my, my friend uh, noticed the boy, of course. And the boy knows that I am, he doesn't take, I don't think um, the boy that Malcolm portrays feels that he is, uh, let's say, completely ignored, because he, I don't think he thinks pe girls can be, can, can, well, will not, girls will ignore him. He has got a sense of ego, to a degree, to a degree, because if he had had a real ego, maybe he would not, he would not have done what he had done or been what he became, you know, which was, uh, terrifying you know it's due to the way you're brought up uh if you you never see anybody in the film dressed like them they dress in a particular way and he's the head of the group 
But the moment that falls, he falls too. You know, Mm -hmm. he's very vulnerable. Inside that, there is a baby, a big baby crying. You know? That's a great read on his character and from someone who, uh, for your own part, helped to define his character. I think that's no overstatement. Um, Mm. Every character that uh, Alex interacts with does contribute um, not just to his outcome, but to the story at large and to the questions the story poses for society, for all of us, um, not just in our part in society, but as individuals. But I, I would love to ask you if you have an opinion on what is perhaps the most fulfilling thing for you as an actress. And there's no right answer. Of course, I would be curious to know if it was anything outside of clockwork. Don't feel obliged because we're speaking about Kubrick, of course. I think that there was a film I made, which was not English, and it's by a very well-respected um, French director called Georges Franju. And uh, I think he made a film called The Girl Without Eyes or something like that. Uh, I know that that he was he is Patti Smith's favorite um, film director. Interesting. And I made a, a film with him uh, and a young actor who now is uh, very big in theater, uh, Francis Huster, uh, this is his name. Um, I was very proud that we had to have a love scene and it was very delicate. And the film director wanted us actually to make love. And Francis had protected me from that knowledge. And just before the scene, he said, oh, I want to speak to you. And he took me into a little, a very pretty little cabin. We were in the countryside and he explained and he said, but we are not going to do what he wants. Uh, uh, Which was lovely of him. We will pretend. And I remember lying on the grass with Francis on top of me. And it was really quite something because the crew, the whole crew was around us, which was, I mean, unheard of. Mm -hmm. You're, you know, if you're doing something, if you're supposed to be doing something like that. So, um, and I remember at one point, the girl, and that's me, I actually do shed a tear. It's a real tear. And it works perfectly when you are new and um, in that particular position. I'm proud of that because we made something which could have been considered pornographic by stupid people, Mm -hmm. but it was not. It was actually tenderness itself, and it was pure. It was absolutely pure, and it's got nothing to do with um, English or American film directors or, or any other film director. The film director was conned by this young um, actor who then became very big, you know, uh, made his own... He wrote his own plays in in the Comédie Française, you know. And Francis went up to Georges Franju and he said to him, by the way, I just wanted you to know that we were acting then. And Georges, he hit a fit and he was crying. Mm. He was crying. How could you do this to me? It's not the same thing at all. And Francis says, of course it was. You were you didn't know the difference. Precisely. Exactly. And I, for me, this in my whole career in films, I thought that was the most beautiful, kind thing that ever could have be felt well happened to me. This young man was very intelligent. And Georges Franju, who was a very brilliant film director he was a he began as a documentary maker and um he was very well known 
very highly respected. He was a child. Mm. He ha- you have to sometimes um, trust actors, trust them, and they will give it to you, will give you the right thing, the right one. Mm. Not just lovely chatting with you, but uh, to hear your your take on all the questions we've thrust upon you with such eloquence is, is truly a marvel, and we're grateful. We're, we're sure the listeners will be as well. Oh, well, you're very, very kind. Thank you. You make, you make it easy, Jillian. <laughs> you make it too easy. I, thank I, you. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I will ask you... Uh, one last question, which is an open-ended question we love to ask, and another with no, you know, uh, brackets, right answer and brackets. But the question is, in your mind, who is Stanley Kubrick? He's a filmmaker hmm. and a father and a genius all rolled up in one, and I can't have one word for him, really, but I think that he has produced extraordinarily important films, films as messages. Basically, I could say he's the messenger. Hmm. I don't know if I've ever heard a response as... As lovely as that, I, again, I'm falling short of words, the right word for, I'm, I'm sure I'll have to process that. He's the messenger. <laughs> no, I really, really, really like that. Well, he's done a lot. And if you look back at his films, you know, um, he hasn't been on earth for nothing. Mm. Here, here. Yeah inarguably one of the greatest artists period of the 20th century. Yeah. I I have to ask as an additional, have you seen the majority of his films or all of them? I haven't seen all of them. Uh, I've seen the one which really startling, the one about war. I'm, I'm talking about these, all these men Around the table with George Scott, etc. Oh, Doctor Strangelove, of course. Oh, that one. That is, that is. Well, that's us, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah. Yes. That's that's well said. That's us, isn't it? <laughs> he seemed to touch upon uh, such innately universal themes of, uh, you know, man's wrestling with himself if you will and uh well i'm sure stephen would agree there's a a misperception many might have the, of, of a, a degree of pessimism that exists in his work but uh, i i wonder if you would have the alternate take that that we do and upon further examination it really does come through quite clearly that kubrick again as you would say as a messenger yeah. is saying, no, we can be that, but we must be this instead. Yeah. That's a very rare artist. Yes. I digress. And you're wonderful <laughs> for allowing me to do so. <laughs> thank you, Jillian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You've been so kind with uh, answering all our questions about, your life's work as an actor. And of course you do have a a wonderful music career and, and you have a new album out called Lily. Yeah. Um, Tell our listeners a bit about your musical career and your new album, please. Well, my musical career, you know, in life there are um, just incidents, things that happen. Um, and I remember when I made my first film, something happened and uh, I was asked to sort of la 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 something. And uh, I realized, and then the album came out. Um, Adam Faith made the album. And, um, and 
Shirley Ann Fields was singing. And I thought to myself, I think I'd love to sing. Music was terribly important for me because mm -hmm. if you were miserable, you listened to music and um, it all went away. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was at the time when my discovery of my youth then was through music. Um, so that happened at 14. And when I went back to France and they couldn't bring out the film uh, Beat Girl, um, I was in a quandary. And my agent said to me, what would you like to do? And so I said, without thinking, I just said, I would love to sing. I said, ah, well, I'll have a look at that. I didn't realize he had a, a singer who was an, an American singer called Eddie Constantine, who was very big in France. I didn't know that. And he was, he was an actor, a good actor too. Um, so he went to see Eddie Barclay. And Eddie Barclay always liked people who were well known because it uh, helped him to have a record uh, passed on the radio. Uh, so I went for a test, a vocal test, and there was a musician there called Jacques Lucier, who would then become very big. He was a jazz musician, and I was very much into jazz. I loved old, um, Ella Fitzgerald, but I loved Peggy Lee. I loved lots of music. Mm. I just loved music. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, I was supposed to sing two songs. And uh, I said to Jacques, uh, well, could I sing uh, Fever? You know, cause Fever was very well known then. Of so course. I sang Fever. And, um, and Jacques said, well, what's the second one? I said, well, um, let's make Whoopi, you know, making Whoopi. Mm -hmm. It was a completely different thing. But I was very jazzy. And after that, uh, Eddie Barclay came down and he said to me, you have to listen to yourself. You'll be surprised. It's fabulous. I said, what? He said, yes, you must. You must come into the cabin. So you have to walk upstairs and it's a closed enclave with sort of like, you know, the, the, there's a, there's a glass, there's glass so that the, they can see you, you can see them if you've got to stop, you know. So I go upstairs and I listen and I remember listening to fever first and just the first few words and i and i remember turning to eddie and saying this can't be me this can't, this is not me and he mm. said yes that is you wow because when you hear your voice and it's loud louder than life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you suddenly hear something else. And I had a sound in my voice and I have a perf, I always have had a perfect rhythm. Um, and there we go on the spot. I was, mm. uh, I was 15. So the next time I went into the studio, I, uh, I sang with a, a very lovely jazz, um, musician, singer, but who then also was much, much bigger when he was singing um sort of different types of songs with his guitar not rock and roll not not that but french songs mm -hmm. but sweet and i had it he had a hit that summer with me um it was i'd open i'd i'd turn the knob and i would hear myself and it was really funny made me mm -hmm. laugh i thought it was a joke you know um but i was dead set on singing so the next time um, I went, it was Eddie Constantine, and we redid the Marilyn Monroe song. Um, there were two songs in the film that she made with Yves Montand. I can't remember. Let's Make Love. It was one, that was one of them. And another. Si l'on se fie au dire des journaux, si l'on en croit tous les échos qu'ils donnent, Les gens cités dans l'actualité ont tous un truc pour décrocher la pomme. Cette chose subtile sépare leur chance. Un truc qui dit on fait la différence. Vive la vie. And that one, Eddie was not at all happy. He didn't want me. He wanted his 
daughter. I didn't know that. Maria Cala. A vraiment la classe. Dans la vie même, elle aime vocaliser. Spécialisation. Spécialisation. Pour nous faire jaser faux. And he kept on stopping every 10 seconds. So, and I, being the good content girl, you know, I kept on singing, which drove him crazy. He thought I was trying to trip him up. It wasn't that at all. And somebody understood and came down and said, Don't. He said, When he stops, you stop. So I did. And then the next was Zubizou. And I was very, very upset because I could. I sang Zubizu once. That was it. And I liked the song. And I thought, oh, what a shame. I'll never sing it again. You know, you sing it on, on the album, it's, it's there. Uh, and that's that. But strangely, uh, it got picked up much later uh, by a TV show, you know, Mad Men. And it was funny because I always dreamt of uh, Madison Avenue. When I was in, in French school, I wanted to walk on the pavement of Madison Avenue. That was my wish. That was all I wanted in life, Madison Avenue. And there it was, Madison Avenue. There was this advertising agency on Madison Avenue. I was actually, I, I did go to live in New York and I still live in New York and I live in the UK. You know, I have two homes and I'm blessed because uh, New York is incredible for art, you know, absolutely amazing. There's enormous vitality. There is total, well, I think total, um, that people speak in very loud voices. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of energy going around. Bloody Americans. <laughs> a lot of energy. <laughs> you have to pick, pick, pick the right one. That's it. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yes. When did you uh, get your first residence in Manhattan? Oh, I think I arrived in, let me think. I think I arrived in 70. Seven. It was an incredibly cold winter. I thought I was going to die. The the newspapers were flying in the sky. It was very windy. I remember that. The, the remember, blizzard. Right? Yeah, the blizzard of oh, 77. I grew terrible. up here. Yeah. You did? I, yes. Yeah. I still have pictures of uh, my parents' first home, you know, and the snow up to the mailbox, you know, ha halfway up the, the door. Oh, I lived on um, I lived on Third Avenue, in front of a, a very nice bookstore, and it was Third Avenue and Ninth Street. And I did not know, because I I decided I wanted to stop acting. Um, I did not know that opposite was well, there were all sorts of interesting things happening. I I remember seeing William Burroughs in the street. I thought that's interesting. Mm. Um, it was, there was a church there. I saw Jim Carroll. Uh, and there I was uh, facing East Manhattan. The, the view was marvelous. Mm -hmm. The university wasn't yet built um, over the car park. Um, and I had a, the New York, it was called the New York Art Central, uh, the NY Art Central. And that was where all the, um, all the paint was sold and the wonderful paper downstairs. And I was in my element. Uh, I was like a, a chameleon. You know, I, I, I think um, 
I began to draw when I was about, uh, yeah, my first drawing was at 11. Then I didn't draw anymore. And then I, I drew a self-portrait at, at 11. Uh, and then I didn't draw anymore until somebody asked me in Paris, what would I have done if I wasn't an actress? And I said, well, I would have, uh, I would have been a, a painter. So she said, well, do something right now. And I, I thought, oh, my God, draw your portrait. She, so I said, what do I do? Uh, what, do what, what would you like? She said, your portrait. And um, I, think, I think I might put it online because the extraordinary thing is I, look, I began to look like her. Uh, I, did, I was only 14. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when I reached round about 18, I looked like her. So, Fascinating. Yeah. Um, having made the album and... Having been, you know, the album is an autobiography. I would never have made it otherwise. Mm. Never. Never thought of, I wouldn't, if something said, I want you to sing, I would have said no, not imp- not interested. Mm. But I I realized I, I needed to do that for, for the girl. I was, uh, some friends I made on the beach uh, gave me a name called Lily. And that was the only secret. I, I kept from my mother because she she was into all my things. She she didn't she didn't allow me to grow up. So I had Lily, and I and I began, and I made the album. And now I I I want to do, I want to go back. I want to do my drawings, and I want to paint. Interesting. Your 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 cyclical uh, yeah. way yeah. of of moving through the arts in your life seems to. Uh, reconnect with itself reconnecting you with yeah er- everything you've hold dear within the arts yeah how how did you come to the process of recording this new album what was it that finally had you say now's the time yeah now's the time um i'm just trying to think i um i'm trying i th- I really don't know. It was just sort of, it was Havana. Hmm. It was Havana, Cuba. That's what it was. Um, There was an artist that my husband was looking after, an Italian, fabulous voice. Um, He writes his own songs. And there were Cuban uh, guitar, you know, not guitarists. They were were playing every single instrument, really. And there was a a person called Peter Vettese, and we used to have our best meal was breakfast. Uh, so I'd go down for breakfast and poor Peter was left alone with me. And I would say to him, oh, Peter, I'm so, it's never happened to me before. But for the first time in my life, well, since something a long time ago, I would love to be just a fly on the wall. All I want, all I want is to know how these songs evolve. That's all I want. And I'm not a fly. And I'm here. I'm in Cuba. I'm in Havana. I will go, uh, you know, to Hemingway's place, which was actually fascinating. Um, His library is still there. His shoes, his real shoes are there. He left everything Mm. when he left. That's it. And it's been kept as Mm. is. So it's it's a wonderful experience. Mm. Um, But then I... I just got this thing that I, I began to, to, to draw. I began to draw when I came back. I don't know. I just began to draw. I began to, to sing with Peter. Peter was very kind. Peter realized that I was frustrated and he became very curious. He said to me, come to my studio. I have a studio. And, um, he said, I have a studio and um, we'll see what you're like. And I think he was incredibly, well, gracious. Um, who else would have done such a thing, frankly? Mm. Um, so I went. I can't remember. Oh, yes. I had, um, I had something because I was writing poetry. I have a, a grandfather who was a poet. He's Polish, but he's very, very, very well known. Um, when I say but, it's because if you write Polish and the Polish that he wrote in, he rewrote the language in a way. So he's rather like James Joyce, 
and he's mm. in, in poetry he's untranslatable so um i i began to had this jag of writing poetry for quite a few years um probably five something like that uh and i was writing about my past about me things that nobody knew and things that i knew um everything really and it just fell out of me like like water in 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 a in a in a glass so um i took some some of my something i had written and i know i'd had somebody came round um i wanted to find out how the machines work because at that time they were inventing things like they would distort the voice things like that and i was very 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 curious and so he organized me and he said to me before leaving he said look um what i want you to do i've got you on your computer i want you to know how to record yourself on your computer i won't leave before you do that so i only had one poem uh, on the on the desktop and so i pinged on that i pinged on the whatever the button and i began to sing and i sang the first uh round about the first half of nefertiti it all came out because it was a poem but i didn't have any i didn't know i was going to do it it just walked out of me and then i said to him he was um gary moore's tech he was very 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 sweet and i said to him i'm terribly sorry but i i don't i i don't know what to do i i've just done this i know i've done something but i have to do the rest he said okay but you've done something and you you you'll have to go from there never titi what you have there is the original me composing the song so we kept that that's lovely steven has three daughters and i am going to stick my neck out and and mention that one of steven's daughters is in fact named lily oh how lovely i dedicate it to her lily i dedicate this song to you all right i'm going to cry Jillian is such a wonderful, amazing lady, and we really enjoyed bringing her to your lovely ears via Kubrick's Universe. You should definitely check out her new album, Lily, which is available at all the usual streaming services, and please do check out her YouTube channel, Jillian Hills Official, where you can hear tracks from her entire career. Our show was produced by the indefatigable Stephen Rigg. I'm your host, Jason Furlong, signing off until next time. Take care everyone. Thanks for listening. And to quote the wisdom of Ted Theodore Logan and Bill S. Preston Esquire, be excellent to each other. It's Kubrick's universe. We just live in it. We have taken very thorough precautions in this podcast against broadcasting anything which might only be attributed to human error. These guys aren't scientists. They're making it up as they go along. Thank you for listening to the Stanley Kubrick podcast. Come back soon.
It was real nice talking to you. Bye. Over and out. This show comes to you from the Stanley Kubrick Appreciation Society.